Okay, thus far we've we've uh, kind of run a straight line from solving um, for the creep compliance from the gener from the uh, generalized uh, Kelvin Voigt model, and then we moved right into hereditary integrals. I want to come back now and revisit the relaxation modulus, and I'm not going to go through all the derivations. Uh, I think having seen them once for the creep compliance, uh, you, you can go back yourself and replicate them for the relaxation modulus, and in fact, you'll do that in a homework set. What I wanted to do here is, is to um, just develop the complementary um, equations that would uh, correspond to the creep compliance, but now for the relaxation modulus and just kind of show you the parallels, uh, noting that the development is very similar between the two. Okay, so let's begin and we'll start back with the, the uh, governing equation for the generalized um, uh, models, both the Maxwell and the Kelvin Voigt model. Okay, so let me just say, recall, uh, the generalized differential equation, right, for the the generalized Maxwell and the generalized Kelvin Voigt models, right? We had a kind of a differential form that we used. We said P uh, operating on sigma, right? Remember that P was a differential operator, was equal to Q operating on epsilon, right, where Q was a differential operator. So I'll just remind you of that. So these are differential operators. Okay, we'll call that equation one. Okay, so uh, in Laplace transform space, we can write equation one. So in Laplace transform space, uh, we, can, we write this as P bar times sigma bar is equal to Q bar times epsilon bar. Okay, I'll call that equation two. Okay. So this is where we began our discussion on creep compliance. Okay, so let me remind you what we came up with. Okay, for creep compliance, uh, remember what creep compliance is. That's where we um, apply a, a sudden stress and we observe how the strain grows with time. So for creep compliance, uh, we selected uh, a, a generalized... Uh, Kelvin Voigt model, okay, and we said that the stress was equal to the heavy side function, and then the strain correspondingly would just be the creep compliance, okay. So that was pretty straightforward. Okay, so now, um, and now we want to talk about uh, the 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 um, Laplace transform of this. So just basically applying these sigma equal to heavy side function and epsilon equal to the creep compliance uh, in equation two, we find that we can write that uh, P bar and now uh, sigma bar, the, the Laplace transform of the heavy side, if you remember from your table, is just one over S. And that's going to be equal to Q bar times now epsilon uh, becomes J. So this would be J bar. Okay. And we could go ahead and solve for J bar. Uh, as uh, P bar divided by uh, S times Q bar. Okay, let's call that equation three. Okay, so when we solved for the, the um, N component generalized Kelvin Voigt model, okay, so when we solved um, for an N component or an element, however you want to write it, uh, generalized Kelvin Voigt model. Okay, I should change this to generalized Kelvin uh, Voigt. Okay, when we solve for that, <clears throat> we ended up with the following. Okay, we found that we could write J as a function of T, so the creep compliance now, with some initial time independent component of the creep compliance, J naught, right? Um, plus, then however many other additional components we had. So from I equals one to N of J sub I, one minus E to the negative T over tau sub I, okay? And we called that, let's go ahead and call this equation four. Okay, so I'm just reminding you of what we've already covered. So I didn't derive anything new. 
How about for the relaxation modulus? Okay, so let's let's still look at equation two, but now see if we can apply um, the same principles to get a relaxation modulus. Okay, uh, for the relaxation modulus. Okay, and I'm gonna uh, I I have used e sub r in the past, but I don't want to have a subscript uh, when I might have things like i in uh, subscripts i as well in my in my solutions. So I'm going to just call the relaxation modulus, I'm going to call it y. Okay, so relaxation modulus y, uh, uh, which which will of course be a function of t. Uh, we're going to just like we're going to reverse these um, assumptions that we'd made for the for the creep compliance. Okay, so we'll say that sigma in this case, uh, let me actually define epsilon first, and then sigma will fall out. Epsilon, uh, is going to be equal to now just the heavy side function, right? So basically, we would normally have epsilon naught. We're just setting epsilon naught equal to one for the sake of the solution, and that is going to Im uh, imply that sigma uh, is going to be just equal to y, the, the relaxation modulus. Okay. Okay. So then, if we do that, then equation two. Um, so then, use equation two. And we end up with uh, p bar, so sigma bar now is just y bar, uh, is equal to q bar, and then epsilon bar is just, again, the, the Laplace transform of the heavy side, which is just 1 over s. And we can go ahead now and solve for y bar in this fashion, right? And find that y bar is going to be equal to q bar divided by s times p bar. Okay, let's call that equation five. Okay, so let's compare now equation three and five. So uh, they look like they're related, right? One has this p bar over q bar term, one has a q bar over p bar term. What if we just multiply those together? Multiply j bar times y bar. Okay, so let's just say uh, comparing uh, equations three and five, and actually we're just going to multiply them together. Okay, we have this relationship. We find that j bar times y bar is equal to, well, my, my p bar and q bar terms cancel out and I'm just left with one over s squared. Let's call that equation six. Okay, so what's the point? The point is that creep compliance and uh, a relaxation modulus are related, and they're easily related in the Laplace space, uh, not so much in the time domain. Okay, but just be mindful of that. So creep uh, compliance uh, and the relaxation modulus, okay, uh, are related. Okay, and of course this is uh, easy in Laplace transform space, just like we showed here in equation six. Okay, so um, essentially what that means is you don't need to find both. Once you have one, uh, you, you, have, you, have, uh, uh, you can acquire the other one, basically. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Okay, so I'm not going to go through the solution process. I'm just going to give you the solution because I think you can um, uh, sort of see the similarities. And I'll just say that solving right for uh, y of t for the relaxation modulus, uh, in a manner similar uh, to to what we did for j of t. Okay, so in a manner similar uh, to j of t. Okay, uh, yields the following. Okay, it's going to be something that you're familiar with. We'll say y as a function of t is going to be equal to y infinity plus the sum from i equals 1 to n of y sub i e to the negative t over tau sub i. Okay? We'll call that equation 7. Okay? A couple things to point out. If you remember in the creep compliance, uh, this first term was the, the initial creep compliance, the, right? This term is actually the long time modulus, not the initial modulus. So this is the long time modulus, right? As time goes to infinity, this is that term. Uh, and then this tau sub i, 
These are relaxation times. Okay, so uh, again, a very similar uh, set of equations, um, and and you, you can obtain them, like I say, in the in in the same way that we did before. That is, um, taking the Laplace transforms of those um, uh, differential operators, um, writing writing the the quotient as as a series of partial fractions, taking the inverse Laplace transform, um, and 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 uh, proceeding from there, and then doing a little bit of algebraic simplification to get to equation seven. But the idea being that you still end up with now an exponential series uh, that is describing um, the relaxation modulus. Okay, <clears throat> in the case of the creep compliance, J, uh, we, we showed how we could use that in an integral form, namely a hereditary integral, to uh, to take a any stress history and then use that in conjunction with the creep compliance term and and then compute the strain history. So you might and you would be correct in, in thinking that we can use the relaxation modulus maybe in conjunction with a strain history to uh, compute uh, the stress history uh, for any material. Okay, so let me just remind you of that. Uh, just remind you of the form that it took. I'll just say recall. Okay, that using J of T, the, the creep compliance, uh, and a stress history, okay, a stress history, uh, we could compute the entire strain history. Uh, and using hereditary integrals. Okay, and we wrote those as epsilon of T is equal to the integral from zero to t of the creep compliance as a function of j minus c, where c is our uh, variable of integration, times sigma dot, which is a function of c, dx c. Call that equation eight. Right. That was the form that we had for our first hereditary integral. Um, if we had so for uh, an initial instantaneous load, uh, we we broke out that first term and we said, well, that's Epsilon of t is equal to that instantaneous load sigma naught times j of t, and then plus this additional integral, integral from zero to t of j t minus c uh, sigma dot c d c. Okay, where obviously sigma dot doesn't have the the delta function for that initial jump in it. Okay, call that equation nine. Okay, so. Again, I'm not going to derive it because it's the exact same procedure. Uh, in the case of the creep compliance, we talked about applying a series of stress jumps. Um, in the case of um, the relaxation modulus, we're going to talk about a series of strain jumps. Okay, so I'll just say that in a complementary fashion. Okay, so in a complementary manner, how about? Uh, you can use uh, the relaxation modulus y of t uh, and a strain history uh, to compute a material's stress history. And we do it in a very similar way. We'll say uh, for that first equation will be sigma of t is going to be equal to the integral from 0 to t. Now, instead of the creep compliance, we have the relaxation modulus, t minus c. And instead of the stress rate, now we have a strain rate, epsilon c, d c. Okay? Again, follow the same procedure for what we did to develop the hereditary integral, except now do it uh, uh, for the relaxation modulus. So come to this uh, exactly. Okay? And similarly, uh, for an initial uh, instantaneous strain, Okay, for initial uh, instantaneous strain, right, we can break out that first term and say that uh, sigma as a function of t is equal to epsilon naught times y of t, right, plus the integral from 0 to t, the relaxation modulus y, a function of t minus c, times uh, epsilon dot, which is a function of c times dxc. Okay, call that equation 11. Okay, so that's the the complementary formulation for um, the relaxation modulus. 
Um, again, the derivations have been skipped because they are so similar to the the um, creep compliance calculations. So I recommend if you're interested, go back, review those, and then try try this on your own to develop uh, these uh, equations.